Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to my channel. My name is Mikey. You guys are rocking with me on Mikey's Intellectual Corner. On today's history reaction, we're going to be diving back into our Napoleonic Wars series. This is Wellington Strikes Back, Salamanca, 1812. With that being said, again, as always, we're just going to dive right into this one. Let's go. By 1812, Napoleon's French Empire had a quarter of a million troops stationed in Spain, bogged down in a war that seemed to have no end. They faced a bitter struggle against the people of Spain, who'd taken up arms in a guerrilla war, as well as the remnants of Spain's field armies and an Anglo-Portuguese army under Lord Wellington. But French forces in Spain remained formidable, and in firm control of the capital, Madrid, and most major cities. And the year began with another great French victory in the south, and a calamity for Spain. Yeah, so honestly, my personal opinion would have to be the fact that because he had so many troops, I mean, uh, what do you say, a quarter of a million, that's what, 250,000 troops bogged down in the Peninsula War, yet I feel like that uh, long list of other things, in my opinion, why um, they, he lost, eventually lost at uh, Aspern, but, you know, that's just my opinion, though. Let's keep it going, though. Okay. Spain and Portugal would become a graveyard, not just for young French conscripts, but for the reputation of some of France's most famous generals. General Junot, Marshal Soult, and Marshal Jourdain had all tasted defeat. Marshal Massena had been recalled in disgrace. Marshal Louis Gabriel Suchet was the exception. French generals in Spain were notorious for their looting. Honestly, uh, my honest opinion with uh, Marshal Messina, he, I feel like he was, that, that was going to happen to him regardless and eventually anyway. Most of his battles, most of his victories are way behind him, beginning of this whole conflict. This man freaking went into battle, went into uh, war essentially with a freaking mistress on top of other things. Like he already lost the respect of his men and all the other stuff. So, you know what I'm saying? Like. I feel like that was going to happen to him either way. For their looting, Soult, based in Andalusia, was probably the worst, reckoned to have stolen one and a half million francs worth of art from Spanish monasteries and churches. As governor of Aragon, Marshal Suchet behaved very differently. He enforced strict discipline on his troops, punishing any who tried to steal or extort money from the Spanish, while treating local authorities with respect. He combined this hearts and minds strategy with ruthless military action against the guerrillas and was able to establish firm control of Aragon. That's just good leadership right there though, you know what I'm saying? I feel like that's that's what a lot of different um, countries try to do still to this day because I know America has been trying to do that, well, was trying to do that in Afghanistan for the longest time with trying to, you know, their hearts and minds. And obviously it works. Maybe control of Aragon. In June 1811, after a particularly bloody assault, Suchet took the port of Tarragona, for which Napoleon rewarded him with his marshal's baton. The emperor then sent him reinforcements and ordered him to take Valencia. First he routed a much larger Spanish army that attacked him at Saguntum, before he laid siege to Valencia. The city was packed with Spanish troops and refugees, and to avoid starvation, General Blake surrendered Valencia on the 8th of January, 1812. The French took eight- Yeah, so it sounds like just the amount of people alone in the city is what mainly it led to them surrendering with the imminent looming, you know, threat of starvation on top of you know, everything else, and you know, who knows how stank that would have been with the, you know, thousands of dead bodies just from starvation, you know, ugh. so obviously that's probably most likely why he did it so fast. 1812. The French took 18,000 prisoners, 
including 23 generals and nearly 500 guns. It was a devastating blow to the Spanish cause. But to reinforce Suchet, Napoleon had stripped troops from other armies in Spain, and then withdrawn 25,000 of the best troops for his imminent invasion of Russia. The result was that French forces in Spain were now severely overstretched. Just as... Yeah, hopefully uh, the enemies didn't just see that, you know what I'm saying? Because obviously, me as somebody who's trying to get, you know, trying to pinpoint the exact time that I, you know, come in and do something and make a, a change, or, you know, in the battle or whatever, in the war, this would be a perfect time. So hopefully, you know, they didn't take advantage of this, or hopefully they did. You know? Now severely overstretched, just as Wellington prepared to strike. Spanish guerrillas kept Wellington well informed of French movements, and learning that the forces facing him in western Spain had been much weakened, he decided to go on the offensive, to strike a blow before the French could concentrate against him. On the day that Valencia fell, he laid siege to Ciudad Rodrigo on the Portuguese-Spanish frontier. Eager to take the city before Marshal Marmont could march to its relief, he ordered an assault after just 10 days. It succeeded, though Major General Crawford of the Light Division was among 300 killed. Wellington then marched south to besiege the much more strongly defended city of Badajoz. An assault was made on the night of the 6th of April. The first wave attacking the main breach were slaughtered. But what was supposed to be a diversionary attack on the city's castle with scaling ladders succeeded, and the city soon fell. The storming of Badajoz cost the British 3,700 casualties. In the aftermath, survivors went on the rampage, drinking, looting and raping and killing more than 100 Spanish civilians before British officers finally restored order. Well, if I was a Spanish, I, I, I guess, you, obviously they, they need their help to, to kick out the French, but at this point, Portugal and Spanish, the Spanish, I, I wouldn't be, so, I wouldn't blame them for kicking both of them, trying to get them both out at that point, because like, come on man, you're not even helping at this point. Finally restored order. Wellington had secured the two main routes between Spain and Portugal. Now he sent his most reliable subordinate, General Hill, with a small Anglo-Portuguese force to destroy the bridge over the Tagus at Almarath. This was a vital link between Marmont's Army of Portugal and Soult's Army of the South, as the next usable bridge was at Toledo, 90 miles east. The bridge was well guarded by forts and redoubts, but Hill led a swift and daring assault. The French defences were taken by surprise. The bridge itself and all the engineering equipment burned, for the cost of just 177 casualties. Wellington was now ready to begin his advance into Spain. Spanish regular forces and guerrilla bands began operations to tie down as many French troops as possible. While from the Bay of Biscay, Sir Hume Popham's naval raiding force made diversionary attacks on French coastal targets. In four days, Wellington was at Salamanca, as Marmont, outnumbered, withdrew behind the Douro River. But when reinforcements arrived, he crossed the river again. For six days, Marmont tried to march around Wellington's flank, but the British general matched him move for move, their two armies marching in parallel, often within sight of each other. 
But good, uh, that's some really good discipline, uh, honestly, for them not to obviously want to engage each other just right there. Because, I mean, it's like, we're right here, you know what I'm saying? I can see a lot of people getting frustrated because that, that's the only reason I say that. ...within sight of each other. But on the seventh day, Marmon blundered. On the morning of the 22nd of July, Wellington's army occupied high ground four miles south of Salamanca. Marmont was not interested in a direct assault. He still sought to outflank Wellington, threaten his line of retreat to Portugal, and force him to fall back. Around 8am, the French won a dash for a hill known as the Greater Arapil, which Marmont made his observation point. The French army began to swing round behind him. Marmont had convinced himself that Wellington was an overly cautious general, who would not risk attack. The hills hid most of Wellington's army from view. And when Marmont saw dust clouds to the west, he assumed it was Wellington's baggage train leaving Salamanca, beginning their retreat. But it was the British 3rd Division and a Portuguese cavalry brigade moving up to strengthen Wellington's flank. See, this is exactly why, um, you know, scouts and good battle intel and stuff like that is so important because if he, obviously, if he would have been able to have that for this, he would have known they're not leaving, they're staying right here, and we're about to get into a really hard slug match, you know what I'm saying? But he's not even worried for it. He's thinking that they're about to leave, so. Third Division and a Portuguese cavalry brigade moving up to strengthen Wellington's flank because he wasn't planning a retreat. He was about to attack. Around 2 p.m., Marmont ordered the five infantry divisions waiting in the woods behind him to march west to cut off Wellington's imagined retreat. General Mokun's 5th Division, in the lead, stopped to engage what was presumed to be the British rearguard in the village of Los Arapiles. General Tomier's 7th Division continued west past it. Wellington watched as the French left flank became increasingly strung out and knew it was an opportunity too good to miss. He galloped three miles across country to the 3rd Division to give the crucial orders in person. Many of his staff officers struggled to keep up. That's a really good That's a really good leader because, I mean, think about it, he's over here taking every like, little opportunity to exploit this battle to pull out a victory for his men. Even to the point where he's about to freaking, you know what I'm saying, no, like, I, I don't have time to entrust this to you, I gotta take this myself, you know what I'm saying, so, it was really good. Staff officers struggled to keep up. On arrival, he instructed the division's commander, his own brother-in-law, Edward Pakenham, to attack and drive everything before him. Third Division's advance was hidden by low hills until the last minute. Tomier's division was caught completely unawares and shattered by the assault. Tomier's himself was killed Half his division killed or captured, the rest soon put to flight. At this crucial moment, Marshal Marmont was hit by a British shell, and carried from the field seriously wounded. His second in command, General Bonnet, was himself wounded an hour later. So command passed to General Clausel. 45 minutes later, the British 5th Division attacked, supported by two Portuguese brigades and General Le Marchand's dragoons. The French saw the cavalry coming and formed square, but were hit first by the British infantry, who unleashed a close-range volley, then charged with the bayonet. 
The French were routed and charged down by Le Marchand's cavalry. French 6th Division. At this point, it's kind of starting to look a little bit like a massacre. With the French taking the majority of these casualties and getting routed so much. Like, it's kind of crazy. Let's see how this turns out, though, guys. French 6th Division was caught up in the collapse. Le Marchand himself was shot from the saddle. But his brigade had helped destroy eight French battalions and capture two eagles. Wellington's echelon attack continued as Cole's 4th Division advanced in the centre. But Pack's Portuguese brigade was thrown back from the Greater Arapil, and the whole division was soon falling back in disorder. Despite the devastation of his army's left flank, General Clausel decided to launch an attack on the Lesser Arapil, the hinge of Wellington's position. If it could be taken, he might still snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. Well, if he could pull that off and get this from the jaws of defeat, uh, most likely I can see Napoleon being very favoriting him very much so. Because I mean, think about it: him taking taking this battle, this this battle, and and uh, this obvious defeat, and being able to turn around like that's like, incredible. But uh, obviously, this is that's not going to happen. But the French advance was met by fresh troops of Clinton's 6th Division, who poured volleys of musket fire into the French columns. They began to fall back. The French army had lost the will to fight on, its soldiers streaming away into the woods behind them. General Ferre's 3rd Division mounted a brave rearguard action to buy the rest of the army time to escape, but it faced a hopeless task. It was soon outflanked by the British 5th Division, and Ferre himself was killed. Only General Foix's 1st Division escaped in good order. Of course the 1st Division was able to escape in good order. They, they were the only ones who, unless they were like shooting at the division that was on top of the hill, they weren't really doing anything, you know what I'm saying? So of course they were able, and they were pretty far away from obviously the left flank, so obviously they were able to, you know what I'm saying? Fire's 1st Division escaped in good order. With darkness falling and his army exhausted, Wellington called off the pursuit. Wellington had smashed Marmont's army taking 7,000 prisoners and killing or wounding 6,000 more, a French casualty rate of 25% and more than double Wellington's own losses. The next day, dragoons of the King's German Legion attacked the French rearguard and achieved the almost unheard of feat of charging down a French infantry square taking another thousand prisoners. It almost looks like that horse had they actually got to that square because it looks like that horse kind of came down on the on the uh, on the square and kind of crushing a few men helping them to be able to get through. Because usually the horse just you know it's gonna buck up like that. You know what I'm saying? They're not just gonna go in and kill themselves. So that's I think that's usually why it works so good. But yeah. Another thousand prisoners. Wellington now decided to march on Madrid, forcing King Joseph to abandon the capital and retreat to Valencia to join up with Marshal Suchet. On the 12th of August, Wellington liberated the city to scenes of wild celebration. Soult, now at risk of being cut off in Andalusia, abandoned the siege of Cadiz, which had dragged on for two and a half years and marched east to join Joseph and Suchet. The following month, Wellington marched north, pushing the French back from Valladolid and besieging the castle of Burgos. But his army lacked heavy guns, and the French garrison fought bravely. As powerful French armies gathered to the north and south, Wellington... It's honestly pretty crazy that, um that Wellington was able to 
take back so much of the land though for the, uh, the Portuguese and Spanish um, by doing what he did. Obviously, he's about to lose some of that, but he, he honestly got, was able to get a lot of land back. Maybe, let's see. Wellington himself was now in danger of being trapped. He had no choice but to withdraw. Wellington's retreat turned into a desperate forced march through autumn rain. The supply system collapsed, and many starving soldiers looted what food they could find from Spanish villages. Madrid was abandoned and reoccupied by the French on the 1st of November. Wellington was back where he'd started five months before. But despite the campaign's dismal conclusion, his strike into Spain had led to the liberation of huge swathes of the country, and left the French more overstretched than ever. Reinforced and resupplied, Wellington would be back the next year to deliver the final blow to Joseph's Spanish kingdom. 1812 had seen the tide of war turn, and not just in Spain. Because 2,000 miles to the east, in Russia, catastrophe had engulfed the Grande Armée. Alright guys, we'll go ahead and stop right there. So yeah, another uh, another one in the books, guys, for our Napoleonic Wars. Um, so yeah, and another defeat for, unfortunately, for Napoleon. But that wasn't technically his defeat, but it is the Grand Army's defeat. With that being said, though, guys, don't forget to join me on my next episode. I'll see you guys when I see you. Thank you for joining me. I'm out. Peace.